Welcome to the NFL edition of Bet On It. It is week 10. We've got a star-studded lineup for you today. Well, no, they're just the same guys that we have every single week. Marco D'Angelo, Joe Ranieri, Teddy Covers. But wouldn't that have been fun? Like, I had, like, a, a specialty lineup, and, like, we just had, like, all new members. No? Okay. Uh, anyway, Marco's birthday is today, so if you guys could jump in the comments section and wish Marco a happy birthday. You guys are mean to him every other day of the year. You can be nice to him today. So, well... And then you can go back to being mean to him next week. But he has been picking some nice winners, as has Joe Ranieri and Teddy Covers. I got my barking dog last week, but boy, did that best bet sting. We'll see what we've got up our sleeves for this week's specialty segments. But first, we're going to go right into these primetime games. Joe Ranieri, you are up first. Thursday, primetime. Cincinnati is a six-point dog at Baltimore, 52 and a half. Did you hear that, Marco? It's the Thursday night game. Yeah. Good? All right, great. So we'll start there. Uh, and happy birthday there, Marco. Uh, Bengals uh, in this spot. Hey, listen, you, you got a Bengals team that started 0-3, and, and now they're 4-5. and five, And this is, uh, needless to say, a pretty important game for them if uh, they plan on making the playoffs in any way, uh, shape, or form. So this is kind of a season saver, uh, you know, savior kind of game. But... Uh, they are going to be taking on a Ravens team that, uh, while well, they bounced back in a pretty good way uh, last time out. But I do think, and if you look at this total, uh, I think that's the thing that stuck out to me the most was 52 and a half. And listen, we, we've all seen that some of these, uh, some of these 52 and a half, 51, 50, any total in the 50s, we've seen uh, sometimes be a struggle this year to be able to get over. But the I test tells me we've got a Ravens team that can't protect the pass. I mean, look at what they just moved. They went and traded for Tredavious White. And if this was five years ago, I'd say hell of a job. Uh, but with two bum knees, they're pretty much trying to do anything to help them in the secondary. And the problem with that is that you've got a Joe Burrow and a Bengals offense that is humming right now. We've seen these two teams in the past be able to light one another up. Uh, Lamar Jackson, no worries. 7-18-1. 28% against the number is a home favorite uh, uh, between 3 and 10 points here. This has not been an ideal spot to back Lamar Jackson here. We've also seen Joe Burrow, and we all know what Burrow is as an underdog, right? Three or more points, he's 16-3 and three against the number. That includes the playoffs. And I, I, to me, I think this is one that I would have to look at the over here because I do think there could be a possibility of a Ravens running away with this thing, especially if the defense of the Bengals can't put it together. I know sometimes we get scared off with big numbers like this at 52 and a half. I don't want nothing to do with the side. I'd be willing to take a shot at the over in this one and expect a good old uh, classic AFC North shootout, uh, one in which we haven't gotten in a while. But I think we might be in store for a pretty fun game here Thursday night with the uh, Bengals and the Ravens. It's an over for me, Cal. That does look like one of those classic, you know, AFC North dug, drug out, knockout like fights. Mm. Yeah, the total's 52 and a half. So I think that tells you exactly what you need <laughs> to know. The Bengals don't play any defense, and uh, Baltimore gave up a ton of yards to Colorado or Colorado, Denver last week. Sunday, prime time, Detroit minus four at Houston, 48 and a half. Teddy covers. Boy, was I wrong about those Lions last week. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you're going to be wrong about them this week. We're all wrong about teams sometimes. And I really thought the weather was a big part of last week's game. Detroit built in a sense. You know, we know they're a dome team, but the strength of the line, sort of that offensive line in the trenches, I thought helped them a lot in the game against Green Bay. I'm not convinced this time around that Detroit's going to have that same level of success in the trenches. But let's start with this. From a spot, from a spot standpoint, this game screams Houston. I mean, it screams Houston. When we look at the Lions coming off a very satisfying divisional win on the road, they've won and covered, what, six in a row now? This is a team with a big betting bandwagon that gets bigger by the week. And Jared Goff's been doing extraordinary things. 
You know, uh, he's completed 82.8% of his passes and has a 140.1 passer rating. Those are the best ever in the history of the NFL over a six-game span. So Goff's been incredible. The Lions have been incredible. But <laughs> when you're coming off a game in which you're very satisfied with your performance, with Dan Campbell, we're built for this, man. And you read the quotes coming out of that Detroit locker room. <laughs> they were very, very happy and pleased with their performance last week. And Houston wasn't. The quotes coming out of the Texans locker room, you know, uh, here's right tackle Titus Howard. The most frustrating part is that we were the better team. We let that game get away from us. Of course, talking about the Thursday night game against the Jets. And Houston is the better team <laughs> in a large part. And they did get let that game. It wasn't a good showing for the Texans. That said, they played Thursday, so that gives them three full extra days to prepare, really four uh, when it comes down to it. So they will be the better rested team, the more prepared team for this one. And you're talking about a quality squad, a playoff caliber squad that is coming off a couple of bad performances. You know, C.J. Stroud, it's embarrassing to come out here in a primetime game. And get embarrassed like that is never fun. There's a decent chance Nico Collins returns this week, and that's the piece that Houston's been missing when it comes to the passing game. You know, they gained only 4.3 yards per play last week. That's not what we expect out of Stroud and this Texans offense. So I understand how good the Lions have been. I'm not in a rush to step in front of the Lions. But if I'm playing this game, it's Texans or pass, plus the points for this better. I would also have to agree, but I have not done well betting against those Lions. Maybe I should, uh, I don't know, bet them to win the Super Bowl and uh, just ruin Johnny Detroit's whole football season. <laughs> All jokes aside, it's time for the birthday boy. We're going to let him back clean up here. Monday, prime time. Miami is a two-and-a-half point dog at the L.A. Rams. Total 50 and a half. Marco, actually, on the Wager Talk odd screen, We've seen this one come all the way down. Now L.A. only a one-point favorite. Miami was my barking dog last week in Buffalo, and they had multiple opportunities to cash that ticket outright. They didn't get it done, but they did cover the spread. Talk to me about this Dolphins team with a uninjured Tua. Yeah, Kelly, uh, Tua's been back, and hard-fought game for them last week, a game that they m really needed to win, and that loss pretty much ended their playoff hopes. They're sitting at 2-6, uh, and six, and they're going to be looking at a, a long uphill battle. And generally, when a team loses that game that, you know, we like to call it, you know, the dream crusher in college or the reality check in the NFL, I don't want any part of them. But I always tell you, teams that the media wants to – you know, put the fork in them, say they're done, toss the towel, whatever phrase you want to use. There's two types of games that they're going to show up for. And one of them is division games, especially if that division game is at home. Well, that's not the case here. But the other one is if they're playing on the standalone games, the Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night game, because I don't care how bad your season is and how much you've quit. Nobody wants to get embarrassed on national TV. So Miami's going to show up tonight. And the offense in the two games that two has been back, they scored 27 points both times. Now let's flip and look at the Rams. The Rams put up a big performance last week in Seattle, got the win. And they, one of the reasons is they're getting some of their missing pieces back. Most importantly, Cooper Cup. Um, he had, I think, 11 receptions last week. Uh, they targeted him 14 times. That's a big part of the offense, and it's uh, the safety valve for the QB, Stafford, I think you're going to see a shootout here. You look at the Rams, they've given up 20 points or more in every game this year but one. The one game that they didn't, well, they had two weeks to prepare for that when they were coming off their bye week. I look for both teams to go up and down the field. The Rams' defense can be beat. Last week, Geno Smith had 317 yards passing. Uh, they had a total of 424 yards for the game, and that was giving the ball away three times. I think Miami gets points on the board. I'm looking for a good Monday night shootout. I'm going to go ahead and take over the total here. Here's a little note on Miami. Since 2022, Miami on the road, 14-8 and eight to the over. Let's go over on Monday Night Football. 
Hey guys, make sure to keep an eye out on your email and head on over to the Wager Talk website Monday, November 11th, because the basketball edition of the Gold Cheat newsletter will be free all week long. So stay tuned to Wager Talk social media for additional details. Wagertalk.com and click on Gold Cheat. Speaking of gold, we got the man who brings the gold every single Sunday on Last Call with me, giving out those teasers, VR. Let's check in and see how those have been doing, why we're giving them out on Sundays, and some gold for this week in the NFL. Uh, yeah, they now sit at 30 and 9, long teaser 2.0. And it's simple, Kel, I'm going to repeat it one more time. I keep saying that this will be the last time I repeat it, but I just keep giving it out there because I keep getting questions on how to do it. It's simple. When it comes to the teaser, we want the sharpest line possible because we want the game to land near the number. And the highest probability of that happening is if the number is on point. When's the number it's sharpest? The closest to kickoff. Why? Because all the information has been factored into the betting line. We know the injuries. We know the weather. We know what the wise guys are on. Well, there's so much information that we don't know days prior. So at kickoff is when we expect to have the sharpest line, which is why we talk about CLV all the time and how if you get CLV, you become a mathematical certainty to be profitable if you manage risk correctly. This is the opposite. We're not trying to get CLV. We're trying to do the exact opposite of that. We're not trying to be any numbers at all, meaning the market. What we're simply trying to do is wait until the market's its most efficient and find those matchups that we can tease through the key numbers of three, four, six, and seven. That's it. So about 15 minutes before kickoff, we look at those betting lines that allow us to wong tease. And remember, you wanna make sure that that betting line's available at the sharp shops. Not you have a rogue seven and a half when everyone else is seven and you're like, oh, I could wong it, I have seven and a half. No, 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 no. You wanna look at the sharp shops. You want to look at Pinnacle. You want to look at Chris. You want to look at Bet Online. Uh, when you're talking offshore here, you want to look at Circa. You want to look at Superbook. Those are the books you want to look at that reflect sharp money. Um, and that's it. You don't want to lay more than 130. Even at 130, you have close to a 2% edge. You're printing money at that point. But again, you got to manage risk correctly and you have to be in it for the long run. Last week, it split, went three and three. So you would have lost money. But leading into last week, it went 15 straight winners, 15 and 0. So again, you're not going to win every week, but you know going in, you do have the edge. So stick to the long teasers. I'll go over them with Kelly again on last call come Sunday. You don't want to do them now, even if the number is available. You got an eight and a half up there right now. Dude, by, by kickoff, it could be at seven. That's no longer wongable. It could be at nine and a half. That's no longer wongable. And we want it to be an efficient number. If it moves from where it is right now, it's not very efficient. Not going to waste more time in that. Let's dive right into the NFL. Bottom line, start at the top. We'll work our way down. Giants getting a ton of money. Look ahead was three and a half. A three went to four, four and a half, five, five and a half. Now we're looking at six. Again, uh, Panthers are one of these teams that continue to get faded. So could see some sharp money, it, meaning the, the, the betting things are getting out ahead of the public because I didn't, can't see much public love for the Panthers, even as home dogs. Colts at four and a half. Any four and a half that pops up, they're getting love against the Buffalo Bills. You should be able to get that because as the, the money starts getting to the window, we should see more and more Bills money piling up. So the four and a half should become available. Vikings, Jaguars, it's going to come down to Trevor Lawrence. The look ahead was three, three and a half, went to four, four and a half, five. If Lawrence is officially out, this line is going to go much higher. So if you want to try to get ahead of the information, if you have access to it, that's pretty much where this line stands. Steelers, commanders, two-way action. Washington got hit at two and a half. And then Steelers are getting love at three and better. So it's one of those key numbers where you saw some sharp money laying the two and a half. But I can tell you with certainty because I bet for one of the groups that took the three on the Steelers side. Saints, head coach Dennis is out. That's why you're seeing that adjustment from a pick -em up to three, three and a half. And you're seeing the under get hit as well. Um, under 47, 47 and a, I mean, excuse me, it got dummied up from 47 to 48. That's when the under money started coming in. Those I love because the limits are low when it first opens up and you see one of these groups that nail these totals. They sprinkle a little something. The rest of the uh, market copies it and then they come in on the other side. And that's exactly what happened here and why we're looking at 46 and a half on the Falcon Saints game. Remember, open 47, got dummied up to 48. 
That's when the real money came in on the under. Uh, 49ers and Bucks getting 49ers money. A uh, Bucks at plus seven. Bucks at plus seven, seven and a half. But at five, I saw some 49ers love. So again, when the line moves significantly in the NFL, you're going to have a difference of opinion between the two. Another number that they continue to look for are the Titans at eight. Anytime the Titans went to eight, that one was taken. And finally, no surprise, Dak Prescott is out. So the Eagles went from three-point favorites up to seven-point favorites. But more importantly, the total was significantly adjusted from 50 to 48 and a half, now down to 42. I can tell you the guys that I work with, they stopped betting the under at about 45. There may be a couple of piggybackers at 44. But since then, it's been public money that's driven it down this low. Because again, it's Wednesday. The weekend's almost here. Public bettors bet earlier than ever before. It's not like everyone just waits until game day anymore. So uh, that's pretty much what's going on there. Real quickly, I'll give out a play that I gave the subscribers today or yesterday, 4% play. Bills, Colts, I went under. Bills, Colts, we went under 47 and uh, like I said, I like the Colts in that game as well. Uh, but I'm going to sit back and see if I could get a four and a half uh, as Bill's money comes in. Awesome stuff. VR is uh, our favorite gold giver here on Bet yeah. On It. So let's give him some love over on Please. wagertalk.com. VR, let's hear what you got. We got UFC going on. It's NHL season, NBA. You get all of these looks behind your computer screen that you share with your subscribers. Tell me what they can expect now through the Super Bowl. Yeah, great time because you're absolutely right. There's just so much going on with NBA, college basketball, NHL, and then of course, NFL, college football, and I bet MMA each and every week. So there's multiple markets that we're betting at. And uh, that's when you could take the most advantage because most of the uh, all of the attentions on NFL, 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 and then college football. So those other markets, don't overlook them. They will help you get out ahead. We crushed NBA last year in college basketball. I know I was top three in profit overall, already coming out hot. I know I did well in college basketball the other day. It's a little early again for sample size, but I'm looking to fire some 5% plays this weekend. Already isolated a couple and uh, Steam Room will be on Sunday and I'll be back Saturday and Sunday for last call. So head on over to wagertalk.com. All right, VR, we will see you on Sunday for Wager Talk's last call to get all of that last minute gold. All right, from uh, well, the gold to the sandwiches. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but Marco's got a sandwich game of the week. You guys got to bet. This may be the biggest sandwich we've had this year in the NFL. And Kelly, you've given me some crap about some of my uh, shit sandwiches, should I say, over the last few weeks. But they've been getting the money. This week we got a quality one. And when you look at this one, let's just start with where it's at. You've got the Buffalo Bills coming off that game against Miami. That was a huge game for Buffalo. By winning that game, they basically clinched the AFC uh, title for the East. Uh, that game puts uh, Miami five games behind them, uh, puts the Jets four games behind them. They already have the season sweep on Miami, so <laughs> that five-game lead's really six. And as far as the Jets go, they play the Jets one more time in Buffalo, and they already beat the Jets in New York. So that was a very satisfying win, sets them up in a very good spot. That makes them right for a letdown. Look at who they played next week. Makes them really, really ripe for a letdown. Can I say the undefeated Kansas City Chiefs? Can I say the team that has broken the hearts of the Buffalo Bills for how many years in a row uh, when it comes to regular season and the playoffs? Yeah, they've got to be looking ahead to that one. That in itself gives me enough reason to want to take this game. But you throw in that playoff revenge, just that scheduling situation's there. Throw in playoff revenge, where they sit in the division. I've got to look at the Indianapolis Colts in this one. Now, the Colts lost a tough one last week. Uh, Sunday night football against Minnesota. And the week before that, they had a tight one against Houston. But they're still alive uh, sitting at, in this game at 4-5. and five. They may only be 4-5 and five straight up, but look at their point spread record. This team is 7-2 and two against the spread. Why? because all their games, they lose by eight points or less. They stay in it. Joe Flacco regained the starting job last week. A little bit rusty, but uh, I look for him to be better this week. Plus the fact, 
Minnesota has a good defense. I'm not sold on the Buffalo defense, especially if they're a little bit disinterested looking ahead to next week. For this week's sandwich, I'm grabbing Indianapolis. I'm grabbing the points. They need this game bad to get themselves back to 500 and try to get them back into the wild card race. I'll take Indy plus the points. I think they pull the upset Sunday. Kelly, take them plus the points. Take them to sprinkle. You can eat this sandwich. This one tastes pretty good. Yeah, I like the Colts. They were on my long list and possibly for my barking dog. But Marco, I like the sandwich spot even better. And uh, I'm sure we'll add some sprinkles for your birthday, your cupcakes or whatever you're allowed to eat. I got to call your wife and make sure that you're not breaking any rules today. Speaking of cupcakes, Joe Ranieri, are you high game of the week? Which game is too high or not high enough? Mm. Who doesn't love a good uh, cupcake there, uh, Kel? I'm with you here. I do uh, happen to think that maybe this week uh, we are going to be not high enough, especially when it comes to the Pittsburgh Steelers taking on uh, the Washington Commanders. And I love the over in this. It was 44 and a half. I think it's already been bet up to 45 and a half here midweek. Wouldn't shock me if it starts to creep up, but still like the over in this one, simply because when you look at Pittsburgh right now, uh, Pittsburgh's defense, although we all associate Pittsburgh's defense, uh, you know, obviously being known for their defense here, but the reality is when you look at the cupcakes they played, Cal, uh, they have dealt with six of the worst offenses in the NFL right now, whether it be passing offense, rushing offense, they have played the easiest schedule across the board thus far. In fact, the only team offensively that they have actually played with that has a pulse was the Kurt Cousins-led Atlanta Falcons. But at that point early in the season, Kurt Cousins couldn't even plant on that foot. Uh, there is no doubt uh, when you look at Washington, their ability to be able to move the ball and score. We're talking about the number three rated offense in the NFL right now. And Jaden Daniels has had a little bit of time here to be able to get 100 percent healthy. And I love the fact that Brian Robinson Jr. in all likelihood, who was absent last week, should be back for this game. I definitely think Washington's going to be able to move the ball and score points on this Steelers team. They are home. And on the other side, I mean, the Steelers passing attack is completely overhauled here. We know about the trade for Mike Williams yesterday with the uh, with the Jets, which is certainly going to help them. But Russell Wilson really starting to come into his own. In fact, we're talking about back-to-back -back weeks where they have put up Ws against the Jets defense, the Giants defense. I mean, say what you want about the Giants team. The Giants defense has been actually pretty good. And if you look at that Giants game alone, Cal, they drove inside the 15-yard line four separate times against that Giants and unfortunately had to settle for field goals in that game. So the scoring was a little bit suppressed. But I'm okay with that because Russell Wilson, outside of that initial first quarter when he started a game a few uh, a few games ago, he has been absolutely moving the ball. And this Steelers team, not only little balance being able to run the ball, but also being able to throw the ball now deep with Pickens and company. I, I don't see how they're not going to score on this Washington defense. Why? Well, because everybody else has scored on this Washington defense. I would not be shocked, Cal, if this thing lands much closer to 50 than uh, it is going to be under in this spot. I think the 45 and a half liked it at 44 and a half, but I still like it at 45 and a half. It would not shock me if uh, first team the 30 wins this game, not first team to 20. It's uh, not high enough for my taste, Cal. I'm going over with Pittsburgh and Washington this week. Yeah, I mean, I'll be shocked if Marcus Pittsburgh Steelers can put up that many points. So seems Ooh. seems plausible enough in the National Football League. Just bet opposite of what I think is going to happen this year. Uh, Teddy. <laughs>
I'm kind of yeah. kidding. I mean, it's just been one of those not great NFL seasons. It is what it is. Luckily, just keep it low and don't go crazy. Uh, you do a little segment here called Just the Tip, kind of a stock watch. Last week, you said, hey, let's keep an eye on the Colts. Marco says this is the week to bet the Colts. But do you have another team on your radar this week? I do. And it's a team that's on by this week. When we talk about Just the Tip, a little stock watch, I'm going to talk about the Green Bay Packers even though they're on bye this week. So I'm probably giving this a week early, but I'm not really trying to overthink things. I'm just picking the one that jumps out to me. And right now, certainly Green Bay does. We've got the Packers off a bad home loss to the Lions. They're 4-5 and five ATS, 0-3 oh ATS the last three. They beat the Jags and the Texans, but didn't cover minus 3.5 and, and minus 3. Jordan Love for the season in the seven games he started, 2-5 and five against the spread. So Green Bay has been something of an underachiever, point spread-wise, thus far. Well, down the stretch last year, after the bye, Green Bay was a machine. 6-2 and two straight up, 5-2-1 two and one against the spread, their last eight, to make the playoffs. That includes straight-up wins as dogs against Kansas City, Detroit, and the uh, L.A. Rams. They beat the Chargers, too. That was last year, I understand. But we have this team with this coach and this quarterback who's shown us they can do this before. Jordan Loves has at least one interception in every game that he's played this year. If you've watched Green Bay, you're not worried about Jordan Love making a bunch of bag throws. I think it's being much more hyped in the media than the reality of Jordan Love. There's an enormous luck factor with interceptions. And he's been on the wrong end. Guys have made great catches against him. It happens. I don't think that Jordan Love is a problem for Green Bay moving forward. The running game is there with Josh Jacobs. Love's averaged 7.6 yards per pass attempt. only been sacked seven times. The offensive line is there for Green Bay. They scored, what, 24-plus seven times in nine games and won one of the two that they didn't against Indy in Week 2. So we're not worried at all about the Packers' offense. Defensively, what do they allow? They've allowed 24-plus four times. But this is a defense that had a coordinator change in the offseason. Jeff Halfley coming over from Boston College. They're getting better by the week. And I know that Detroit beat them last week and hung 24. I thought the Packers' defense played well in that ballgame. And they have 19 takeaways. What do the markets do when a team has a bunch of takeaways? Well, uh, number one in the NFL, the markets go, oh, they're lucky. They're undervalued as a result. Only plus six turnover margin because only four teams have more than Green Bay's 13 giveaways. We look at the Packers down the stretch. San Fran, Miami, New Orleans, and Chicago all come to Lambeau. They got roadies, Chicago, Detroit, Minnesota, and Seattle. I see five and three or better out of this stretch. Six and two, seven and one, very possible. And I will absolutely be looking for spots to bet on the Packers moving forward. Just a tip-wise, Green Bay right now a little bit undervalued. It's Kelly? Yeah, I don't know. I watched that team last week. I had my hard-earned money on them, Teddy. But <laughs> this makes it even worse. I can't believe I'm putting my hard-earned money on this Denver Broncos team. Oh, boy. Yeah, I think Denver is barking very loudly. Look, full disclosure... Baltimore absolutely waxed them last week, 41 to 10. But when you start to break down that game, you realize it was quite a bit closer than the final score indicates. And usually when that happens, I'm looking to back a team the following week. There was four different times of drives of 50 plus yards they did not score on. And uh, look, Denver, they have a very strong defense, 46 yards per game uh, under their season average. That is been awesome just allowing under 300 yards per game we know they have a strong pass rush but this is more about a bet against kansas city i watched that monday night football game i had the under and it looked amazing until about the fourth quarter i cannot remember who gave me the under but i'm glad because that way i didn't have to text them about what a horrific ending and overtime that one ended up being if you had the bucks congrats wire to wire had real opportunities to win that game they should have Punch it in for two instead of going to Kansas, going to overtime in Kansas City where you know you cannot win. But that team is still unbeaten after an overtime win. And, uh, wow, I'm not buying this 0-3 against the spread as a favorite of a touchdown or more for one more second. I think Denver is a really scrappy team. We know exactly what we're getting from them. And uh, – I think that you have to kind of look at it a little bit more objectively here from the AFC West perspective. Last year, Denver was able to get a win over this team in Denver. I think there's a real possibility they can go into Arrowhead and pull the upset. Give me the plus eight, but don't forget to sprinkle just a tiny bit 
on that money line. All right, the prop shop's open with the proptologist, Andy Lang. And as I have the script open, I'm going, I think we talked about the Broncos enough already on this show. And uh, Andy's just going to keep piling it on. Yeah, let's let's take the the under on Bo Nix. It is such a low total here, uh, Kelly. I, I it's it's nerve wracking to take an under at two hundred and ten and a half yards, but we're going to do it here on Bo Nix. And Bo Nix, I bet on the last couple of weeks. Why? Because he was facing terrible pass defenses, Kelly. Against Carolina, he threw for two hundred and eighty four yards, and we said he was going to go over against Baltimore last week. He did go over two hundred and twenty three yards. Kelly, he got over on the last play of the, on offense for the Broncos for the game. And the only reason he got over was because they had a penalty that moved them back a few yards so he could have completed a pass long enough. So he was barely getting by uh, by the, the, the hair on his chinny-chin-chin. Chin. Before that, against New Orleans, only 164 yards. Against the Raiders, 206 yards. Kelly, against the Jets, a good defense. He passed for 60 yards and this chief's defense is going to be probably the best defense overall top to bottom that he has faced the chiefs last week even in a game that the buccaneers scored 24 points baker mayfield only threw for 200 yards this is a defense that knows how to stop the run they they are the best in the league at third down and fourth down defense and i just don't think this is a week for bo nix we're coming off of two really good games from him against bottom dwellers for pass defense this chiefs defense they are not effing around they're going to hold bo nix under this total in order to cover the spread i think the broncos are going to have to do it on the ground give me the under on bo nix yeah that's kind of how i expect that game to go anyway which is going to be fine uh andy lang Where's my pills? I need, I, I've been taking my happy Take pills. Take two of these and call me in the morning. We hit our bet last week, so the prescription was great. Take two of these, call me in the morning. You're going to feel better. Uh, thank you uh, to Jacoby Myers, and thank you to you, Kelly. Good luck on your, uh, on your Broncos pick. Thank you. I need it. Real quick before I let you go, tell me what you've got over at wagertalk.com and where else they can find you on the Wager Talk YouTube channel. Well, Kelly, it's November, so that means we have a bunch of big sports up, right? Like, you know, College football, college basketball, NBA, NHL, NFL. We're running a darts special. Yeah, you heard that right. We're running a darts special. Why? Because we have three huge darts tournaments from now until the end of the year. We are 20 and 9 in our darts plays. People have been asking about this. It's $49. We're running a special from now to the end of the year. This includes the world championships for darts. I'm I'm going to say this and you're going to laugh. We're number one at wager talking darts, Kelly. Not in darts bets. We bet on darts because that's where the market is very vulnerable. We've proven this year after year. People have been asking about this. We are running a dart special, $49. Take advantage of it. Like I said, 20 and nine year to date in darts. You do not have to watch darts in order to make money off of it. We'll watch the darts for you. We'll bet on the darts for you. All you have to do is follow the plays. Take advantage of that wt.buzz slash al. Time to put on those nerd glasses because, well, it's time to check in with Ralph Michaels. And Ralph, I had a team that was on my barking dog list until I talked to you. So we're going to get into this TNA segment, and you're going to tell me exactly why I left the Bucks off my barking dog. I thought, hey, maybe a little overreaction to Christian McCaffrey coming back. This is a really solid Bucks team. We've seen them play up to the level of competition all year long. And you said, not so fast, Kelly. Yeah, well, you know, Kelly, let's take a look. You want to talk about one of the most brutal schedules in October and November. You're at a division foe Atlanta. You play a second straight division game at New Orleans. You then host the best team or second best team in the NFL in Baltimore and you lose. You then have the rematch against Atlanta at home and you lose. You then have to go to Kansas City and now you host San Francisco. That is an amazing stretch. And you know, you look at Tampa Bay, they play Kansas City and now they are in short rest. San Francisco is off a bye. Kelly, when I went to the database in the last 12 years, there have only been 20 situations where the away team has had at least 13 days rest against an opponent with only five days rest. Those teams have gone 11 and six, excluding games as a double digit dog against the spread. 
and they're seven and three against the spread in this price range. So that is almost an historic dichotomy in the rest. Talking to Joe, I have to give Joe some credit here. Prior to us filming, Joe pulled out a stat and I didn't even know this. And he said, look up Todd Bowles with less rest than normal. So when Todd Bowles is the head coach going back to his Jets days and he has less than a full week of rest, he is one and nine straight up, two and eight against the spread. And those two games he covered were both on the road. So at home, winless ATS with less rest to prep than regular. Couple other situations I wanna look at it here. San Francisco may be the best four and four team in the history of the NFL, at least statistically. Why do I say that? I am very big on yards per game diff and yards per play diff, taking the offensive numbers minus the defensive numbers. In the NFL, 10 yards per game, when you have a 10 yards per game advantage at the end of the season, that translates to about one win. So if you're plus 100 yards, that means you have likely plus 10 wins at the end of the year. San Francisco is number one in plus 98 yards per game. So even though they have four losses, they are plus almost 100 yards per game on the season. I look at Baker Mayfield. Everyone's excited about Baker Mayfield. You know, I watched him shit his pants here in Cleveland. I'm happy for the guy doing well down in Tampa Bay. But when you look at Baker Mayfield this season, he started the season, the first five games, with an 11 and 2 ratio. His last three starts, he has a 10. 10 touchdown and seven interception ratio. And that was against pass defenses that are number 20, number 27, and number 32. So yes, they looked good, but seven interceptions in three games, all against very poor pass D's. FYI, San Francisco has 10 interceptions on the year. When I look at teams that are an away favorite, versus an opponent off a road loss in overtime. Listen to this number, 25 and nine against the spread, 73.5%. And if you have an away favorite with more than 12 days of rest since 2007, they are 63 and 30, 63.6%. Again, that is a play on San Francisco. That goes to 71% if the opponent is off an overtime game. And finally, one more look at a statistical profile. I love looking at the last four weeks, offensive rushing yards per play, defensive rushing yards per play. San Francisco, the last four games on offense, they're averaging 176 and 5.8. On defense, 115 and 4.3. Tampa Bay's offense isn't bad, averaging 150 yards per game, but the defense is horrendous, allowing 145 yards per game and 5.0 yards per carry. When a team like San Fran can get it done over the ground, it opens up the play action against a very, very um, schedulely challenged Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. Give me the San Francisco 49ers this Sunday. And now you guys know why I'm not betting on the Bucks as my barking dog. Thank you to Ralph for talking me off the edge. Ralph, before I let you go, can you tell everyone what you've got going on over at wagertalk.com? Kelly, I got 5% loaded in college football for Friday, 199 for 30 days, all the sports, every 5% play, code Ralph199 will get you the next 30 days, all sports for $6 and 63 cents per day awesome stuff as always from the stat daddy we're gonna let him go because it's time to bring in the guys for those best bets okay we're gonna let the birthday boy go first on the best bet segments because that's what we do every single week not just on his birthday but happy birthday again to marco but you guys are the ones that get to celebrate Seven days all access package normally sells for $99, but because it's Marco's 
third birthday, you're going to get it for 63 bucks. This is going to get you plays in all of his sports and at least one 5% major wager. These 5% plays sell for 35 bucks themselves, 14 and three in the last 17 games. Marco D'Angelo, give me your best bet for NFL week 10. I will, Kelly, and uh, thanks for the birthday wishes. And you keep trying to push me out the pasture. I've just figured out I'm going to stick around till I get to 100 because the reason we always do this special, I discount it. If I make it to 100, I can charge a dollar more than a regular price. So that's what I'm shooting for uh, with this promotion. We'll go for a while. But, Kelly, uh, you might have liked my sandwich this week, but I know you're not going to like my best bet. This one's going to hit close to home for you. Sorry, but I got to do what I got to do. And I am taking the New Orleans Saints this week as our best bet. Uh, This is a spot where I know they've lost seven in a row. And you're going to ask me, why in the hell would I want this team? Well, I always tell you that when a team uh, fires a coach, they're going to see a spark from that team. One of two things happens. Either they didn't like the coach and they play hard because he's gone, or if they did like him, they still play hard that first game because they want to do well, so it doesn't look like they're the problem. And I think you're going to see a spirited effort from this team. I also talked about teams that are struggling or out of the playoffs, and that's definitely the Saints. What games are they going to show up for? They're going to show up for division games, especially a home division game, which this is where they get a chance to play spoiler. And you've got Atlanta coming in here. I know this is a division game for them, but after the last two games that they played, two weeks ago, they beat Tampa. Tampa's the team that they're going to battle for the division. Then last week, regardless of what their record is, you beat Dallas, that's a big win. They're coming off two big games. Now they're going to look at a team they already beat and a team that's in total disarray. They are ripe for an upset. And let's talk about it. How do you lay points with an Atlanta team on the road? I don't want any parts of that. This is an Atlanta team that has struggled on the road the last few years, and we're asking them to not only win, but win by a margin. And last week, I looked at the box score. I watched the game. I'm still trying to figure out how in the world the Saints lost that game. They absolutely dominated the game statistically. It was the first game back for Derek Carr off of injury. So he had a little bit of rust, was just 18-32, to but he threw for 230 yards. More baffling is they ran for another 197. The Saints had a 427 to 246 yardage advantage. Uh, The public has overreacted to this game. I'm taking the points with the Saints, and I'm sprinkling. I think they beat Atlanta. They went to Atlanta earlier in the year and had that game won for 59 and 55 seconds. (laughs) They lost on a last-second field goal, long field goal, uh, to lose that one by two points. They get their revenge here, get a win, snap the losing streak. Give me New Orleans as my best bet this week. Yeah, it's gross, but I agree with you, except I hope they lose every game from now until the end of eternity. But besides that fact, Marco, uh, maybe they'll still get the cover for you. Joe Ranieri is taking a total as his best bet. Hmm. Hmm, interesting. Yes. Well, I actually, I like uh, the side end total in this game, but we'll focus on the total, and I am going to... I'm going to take a look at the Chargers uh, once again here this week as they have a uh, another interesting game on tap uh, against the Tennessee Titans, who I don't believe will be going back to Will Levis anytime soon. That means backup Mason Rudolph will be in charge of this Titans team. And listen, the Chargers, nobody, and I mean nobody, bleeds the clock like Harbaugh and the Chargers this year. You ready for this? Uh, The Chargers uh, average per play 31 and a half seconds before they actually snap the ball. They are as methodical as they come. And with good reason. They don't want to get in any shootouts. The Chargers defense, by the way, has been absolutely lights out this year. In fact, the Chargers are seven and one to the under this year. 
19 and six since the start of last season. But Harbaugh, I mean, you look at all of these trends, 27 and 11 to the under in his last 38 as a head coach in the NFL. Justin Herbert is under an 11 of his last 12. The Titans are not exactly a team that we're thinking are, is going to produce a ton of points. In fact, they've only produced 61 over the last four games. I'm sorry. I do see their ability to be able to run the ball, bleed the clock. If it ain't broke, we're not fixing it. In fact, all but one of the Chargers games has come in at just around 37 or under here. The number hasn't moved from the open. It's still 38. Uh, and I can see some people coming in on the over. I don't agree with it. I think this is another dead under. I think the Chargers win this game actually rather easily, but there is no way I am looking at an over in this game. I love the Chargers to do what they have done, which is limit bad teams offensively. They will limit this Tennessee team at home, and they will do just enough to be able to win comfortably and nothing more than that. The under 38, my best bet this week with the Chargers and the Titans. Sounds like a snooze fest, Joe. Can't yes. wait to not watch. I'll uh, have it on the Octo box somewhere else. Uh, Teddy covers. Week 10 in the NFL. We're over halfway there. You're telling me who I need to keep an eye on, who I don't. And then you come out with this team as your best bet. Are we betting on Absolutely. it or are we betting against the Patriots? No, we're betting on the we're both. <laughs> you okay. know, what's our basic concept? Buy low, sell high. For any market activity, if the team that you can buy low is a decent team and not garbage, you'll make money with them. If you can sell bad teams high, you can make money with it. And this is a classic buy low slash sell high situation. Let's start with the sell high. All right. New England stinks. <laughs> all right. Uh, they're losing by margin. Four of their six losses this year have come by 16 or more points. And they're off back-to-backs, maximum intensity games, and an overtime loss in the last one. Their second overtime loss of the season. Lots of criticism for not going for two in that spot. The only reason they got to overtime is because Drake May was able to run around <laughs> for like 14 seconds, with the 12 seconds uh, before throwing the, to the TD pass on the last play of regulation. It's not an offense that we trust to move the football. It's a bad defense as well. The run defense got gashed last week. They gave 167 yards on the ground. This is a Pats defense that we thought was going to be good, and it's not, plain and simple. Worth noting, New England last time off an overtime loss, the Jets beat them 24-3. to But let's buy low on Chicago right here, okay? The Bears played a very bad game last week. They got burned by a Hail Mary the week before. Oftentimes you'll see, oh, well, don't let one game make you lose two games. Well, the Bears did a week ago. That being said, the Bears aren't a bad team. They're a good team, at least a pretty good team, all right? And Matt Eberflew's under all kinds of crit criticism this week. Well, great. Guess what? Chicago is a favorite, 3-0 and straight up, 3-0 and against the spread. They can beat teams like New England by margin. Caleb Williams, quote, we still have nine games. We just got to figure out the next step, how to get a win next week. This game's over, talking about Arizona. Can't change it, but we can definitely change the future the markets are zigging on chicago right now this is a team everyone loved a month ago and now they're like, oh no chicago's no good no they just played a bad game new england's the right team to get healthy against if i'm playing i'm laying and yeah this is a client play for me on sunday mm. Ooh, giving out client plays i love that for us Teddy, I don't know if I can lay with the Bears. I, I Give me a little bit more time. That's a team that I can't stomach. And also, I have their season win total under. Uh, I'm still a little bitter about week one with the Titans. But team I'm not bitter about uh, is betting against the Philadelphia Eagles. Been doing it for two years now, so why not do it again? Listen, I don't love this week's card, full disclosure. So I was trying to find some overreactions in the marketplace. Wager talk on screen, the square books have this game seven and a half. Sharp books have this game seven. And I think that tells me a little bit of what I need to know. Yeah, sure, the Cowboys, they're without Dak Prescott. But is Dak Prescott really that much better than Cooper Rush? Cooper Rush has been on this team for five years. He knows this offense just as well as Dak does. He runs this offense in practice. I don't think that this warrants a six-point line move. 
This is still a divisional opponent that, oh, by the way, has injuries of their own. Darius Slay, questionable. Dallas Goder, questionable. A.J. Brown, questionable. Uh, maybe they're not as healthy as advertised. We'll see. I think this is a really tough one because Philadelphia does not go into Dallas and cover games. They've actually dropped six straight against the spread in Dallas. Dallas, on the other hand, has not been anything to write home about this season. One and six against the spread. Nobody wants any part of this team. So why not stamp a nice, solidifying moral victory by covering the seven and a half at home on Sunday without Dak? We'll see if they can't get it done. Oh, boy, what an ugly card. Good thing, my guys, coming in hot with some good spot plays, some good situational plays, some good sandwich plays, and, of course, some really boring totals from Joe Ranieri. <laughs> Shout out to all of you guys for hanging out with us here every single Wednesday night on Bet On It on the Wager Talk YouTube channel. And, of course, we appreciate all of you that hit that like button. Press subscribe and head over to wagertalk.com where you can buy Marco's package, Teddy's package, Andy's package, VR's package, Ralph's package, because all those guys are an intricate part of the show. And Joe and I are just going to keep giving out all our plays for free, and that's because mine have been awful anyway. So feel free to fade, follow at your own warning. Make sure you guys check out the college football edition of uh, Bet On It, because at least over there I'm giving out double-digit underdog winners every single week. Just doesn't matter who they are. They're winning outright. Uh, I'm done. I'm done with my pulpit. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Appreciate you always watching with us. We'll be back here next week. Until then, let's bet on it.